I want to talk about queer Muslims. Why are you running? Why are you running? That's going to be the video today. This is going to be offensive to a lot of Muslims out there, but I simply don't care because queer Muslims exist. <laughs> they be like, yo, what the fuck is it going to take to get rid of this bitch? You can't get rid of me, bitch. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going no fucking where. What is it? What is it? And we deserve to have reasonable discourse about our faith and our places within our community and why exactly being queer is not a choice and how it's not okay that the Middle East essentially sends us all to death sentences or to be forgotten about or pushed out of our countries and out of our communities because they're uncomfortable and behind on concepts of gender and sexuality. <sighs> It's unlikely that any Muslims out there are really going to have their minds changed by this video about the fact that queer people disgust them or they think that we're some unnatural devils. Hey girl! <laughs> or that we are engineered by the West to destroy their religion and everything that they hold near and dear to their heart. But I think that this is just the beginning of more of us becoming visible and... I'm here to make us visible and I'm here to say that we exist and we want rights and we want to be respected in our communities and in fact we do deserve that and I think it's not based in Islam or the Quran or the Hadith. The Quran being the major text of Islam similar to the Bible, the Hadith being a series of written texts, some verifiable, some unverifiable, about the Prophet Muhammad and his lifestyle and how he lived his life. Just to note, these were written several hundred years after his death. But anyway, now that we're beyond definitions in an intro, I would just like to explain that there are about two and a half billion Muslims worldwide. And estimates tell us that about 10% of the world's population is somewhere on the queer spectrum. <laughs> Now with that, that's about 250 million queer Muslims that are out there somewhere, whether they're out or not. They have some queer tendencies there somewhere on this spectrum of sexuality that we know good and well exists. So what happens when one is born in the Middle East to a Muslim family against their will, against any choice that any of us have when we're being born? A multiple things could happen. They could live their lives in the closet and perform their duties to their community, which is getting married in a heteronormative relationship, have children, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They could run the risk of living their lives authentically and perhaps underground and being caught and abused by the police, uh, thrown in jail, never to see the light of day. They could be discovered by their families and honored killed. They could be in an area where major Islamic terrorism has happened and thrown off a building. They could be forced to have a gender reassignment surgery, um, or they could flee to Western countries where it's safe to be queer. None of those are reasonable options for simply being who you are, simply being born yourself. And it truly sickens and disgusts me that that is the norm for us. This is not an invitation to be Islamophobic. I think there's many beautiful things about my religion and my culture. And because it's mine, I believe I have a duty to speak up for my community. That being said, there are conversion therapies that occur within the Middle East. And this isn't new. We all know about conversion therapy in the West. It used to be lobotomies, chemical castrations, hormone therapy, religious counseling. They are horrific things that just harm often queer youth who are forced to go there by parents who they don't have any control over. And these things still do happen in the Middle East. Um, um, often religious therapy or forced prayer, things of that nature occur. It's never been proven to work. It's been disavowed by most major scientific institutions in the West, and even the Lebanese Psychology Association disavowed this practice and took off being queer as a mental illness. Um, but that's besides the point because it still occurs. 
and oftentimes these experiences are so traumatic within these prayer groups that people come together and end up as partners in queer relationships. So the Middle East prescribes no solution for these people that are clearly within their societies. They choose to bury it and not talk about it or hide behind Islamophobia, things of that nature, call it Western propaganda, etc., etc. In Iran, we don't have homosexuals like in your country. We don't have that in our country. In Iran, we do not have this phenomenon. I don't know who's told you that we have it. I hate to say it. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this is. I mean, he could be walking down the street. I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. It's a popular theory as to why the Middle East is so homophobic is because Western imperialism. Back in the day, the Middle East was actually quite queer. So this concept of identity of queerness about, you know, wearing a headscarf, colorful necklace, low plunging neckline, like me as an identity is a Western construction separate from my sexuality. So back in the day, Middle Eastern men who would sleep with other men would not see that as a personality trait and would go home to their wives and kids and people openly knew about this and it was fine. Many Middle Eastern poetry in the 1800s was written about the beauty of other men. In fact, pedophilia was very common, so much so that I can't remember his name, I'll put it up, but he was a writer that went to France and actually discussed how he was surprised that the French were not open to discussing the beauty of other men as a man. So it was clearly a very gay place. I mean, even today in the Middle East, you can often see two men holding hands down the street. Um, and in the West, that would seem like they were a couple that wears the same sex. This is quite normal in the Middle East because it's a gender segregated society. So men and women are confined together and they will get as physically intimate as cultural allows them to without going too far. Um, as I was alluding to before though, the Middle East was actually full of pedophiles before. It was quite normal for younger men to be hooking up with old men, vice versa, whatever the case may be. Um, it was introduced by colonialism, these laws outlawing these practices. A lot of Muslims will call bullshit on this and refer to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah or in Arabic it's known as the story of Lut. And within this story, God destroys the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because essentially what traditional Islamic scholars say is that these people were committing the sin of sodomy or putting their penises in other men's buttholes. Who we went to the city of Saddam, which was on the western shore of the Dead Sea. This city was filled with evil. People of this town attacked, robbed, and killed the travelers. Another huge common evil act among them that they were gay people. Before this nation, no one did this kind of sin. Modern scholars and Western scholars argue that it was not that, that the sins were rape and inhospitality. I believe that because, for one, the Quran is a perfect piece of text, according to many Muslims, says within the story that the sin committed or the sin it alludes to, it never explicitly bans homosexuality because it was never a term back then, so it couldn't have banned a term that didn't exist. The point being is, it says the sin that was committed in these cities was a sin no one in humanity had ever committed before. There are several instances of homosexuality existing before the story had occurred historically, so it could not simply have not been sodomy that was the sin that got Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed in the story because in ancient Mesopotamia in ancient Egypt there are clear examples of homosexual relationships occurring so Two bros chilling in the hot tub, five feet apart because they're not gay. 
unless Muslims are willing to admit that there's a flaw within the Quran, I think that that settles that argument. Um, if you still want to call bullshit on that, that's fine. Um, not really much else I can do for you. We need to contend with the fact that queer people still exist. And I'll tell you why. Even if it is explicitly banned with the Quran, it doesn't really matter because a religion is whatever the community makes out of it. I've been to the Middle East. I have a Middle Eastern family. I have all of them identify as Muslim. Some of them openly drink, pray, eat pork, and are able to live their lives completely fine. I will, however, note that these people are men and that because my culture is very misogynistic and male-dominated, that's why it's okay. But it's never been about religion. So put, to put it simply, because you don't really need to be a super-practicing Muslim to live in the Middle East. So it clearly has something to do with the culture. Some stain that was left on imperialism. Oftentimes in the news, when ISIS has thrown a gay man off a roof in the news, it's not necessarily been an attack on gayness, but it's been an attack on the West. That's been their obsession for however long they've existed, is that the West is this evil force that they need to resist in the name of Islam. So it's not necessarily an attack on gay people in the Middle East, however it explicitly is. I didn't like my wording in this uh, clip entirely, so I just wanted to also add in why I mentioned it's not explicitly about queer people is because there's a lot of Western media attention to when queer people are murdered in the Middle East. That has a lot to do with Islamophobia and depicting Middle Eastern societies as backward and horrible and horrific, when in fact the hundreds of thousands of people are terrorized every day by these terrorists of these countries, and they don't necessarily get the same media attention when they're not queer people. And I think that is important to note in this case. It's more of a symbolic rejection of Western ideals, right? It's, we're not them. This is something that they support, so we will not support it. That's not the only factor. Um, I'm sure the factors are much more complex and have a lot to do with gender and society and corruption and all these religious institutions that rule with an iron fist and refuse to adapt and use religion and the name of God to control people and spread widespread hatred and kill people and do all those horrible things. It's really quite sad that there's actually simply just like no literature on this and that I'm having to kind of scrounge together bits and pieces. It's not fun having to kind of perpetuate stereotypes about my culture or my religion that we're a bunch of ignorant homophobic savages, but we are very homophobic and that's simply the case. Many of us who are lucky enough to be in the position that I am, uh, living their best queer lives, don't want to speak up because let me tell you, it's traumatizing to come out or be outed, whatever your situation may be, and oftentimes it's not safe. There are stories of people um, in the Middle East that I'm sure you're familiar with. One that comes to mind is of a girl named Sada who brought a pride flag to a queer rock band's concert in Egypt. Um, she was then thrown in prison and tortured and beaten until she escaped to Canada, where she later committed suicide. And that is the harsh reality of what we have to go through to simply be ourselves. And I don't think it's okay. And I don't think it should ever happen again. And it's going to continue to happen even after, if you're watching this video a week later, as I'm making this video now, probably in a year from now. Um, but we need to do something. We need to start having this conversation. And we need to stop simply sending death threats because we disagree. Because... Sada deserved to live, and she was a wonderful person, and it's despicable that that's what happened to her. It's also irritating because I know Western liberal democracies have often used the bodies of queer Muslims to justify war crimes and more drone strikes and occupations and more Islamophobia towards people who don't deserve it. Um, I believe that Muslim people deserve to practice their faith openly and live their lives as well. Um, however, queer people don't deserve to tolerate the intolerance. And queer people are often, queer Muslim people's bodies are often just used by so many individuals yet rejected everywhere at the same time. 
with racism rampant in queer communities, with Islamophobia rampant in other outside communities, with um, layered racism. On top of that, depending on if you're Middle Eastern or if you're African, there's just so many intersectionalities that we face. In fact, lesbians um, in the Middle East, while they can't live openly and are still persecuted, they're often ignored as well. Um, there's a concept in Islam that because there's no penetration, that lesbians actually don't or aren't able to commit the sin that is so taboo. But that's a whole other layer of fight that women have to go through, queer women have to go through in the Middle East to be seen, to be recognized, to be legitimized. And I really don't know where to start. I really don't know where to begin, but I think that this is the best start that I can. And I think, again, the Middle East is a very queer place to this day. There's a thriving drag scene in Lebanon. There's a famous singer, Um Kathum, who started her career actually cross-dressing as a boy. Men hold hands. There are many actors in the Middle East who famously played women in roles as drag for the entertainment of millions of Muslims around the Middle East. Natuki. So there's plenty of room for queer people to exist, and I hope that with what I've said that a Muslim person hears this and considers the fact that maybe we're people too and we deserve to live and hold space and have a conversation, and that there's room to consider the double standards in our society, there's room to consider the interpretations of our holy books because as perfect pieces of literature that are meant to provide guidance for our entire lives, it would mean that these things are living, breathing pieces of text. And what I mean by that is that it changes. It has to. It simply has to. That's the nature of everything. What was once new becomes old, and what's new now is going to become old later. And if a piece of text wants to remain relevant, that means it has to be shone in a different light when new information arises. And there's no argument about that. And you can comment death threats till you're blue in the face. You can call me whatever you want, but that's simply the reality. And I don't plan on t to stop speaking about this because this has cost me a lot in my life. And I think for my life to or my life suffering to mean anything, I should take that and educate people and do my best to support other queer Muslims with the immense privilege that I have and the luck that I've had to be safe and to have had great parents who gave me an education. And even though they will feverishly disagree with this as well and have disowned me themselves, I will still give props where props do because they're people and they deserve happiness and they deserve to live their lives. But again, I won't tolerate the intolerance and I won't tolerate lies and I won't tolerate the abuse of power through the shield of religion to oppress anybody. That's all I have to say about that. And I hopefully will have more thoughtful discussion to provide on this topic one day. But um, for now, I think this is a good place. I think I've made a couple of good points throughout this video. Um, although it's been a little bit personal, a little bit emotional, I hope people understand that there's merit to what I've said and there's truth to what I said. Thank you.